Okay, today is a Friday, December 22nd, and Guild Wars 2 uh, was recently featured in an interview article on wistifatech.com. Uh, some I had no idea this was a thing. Some other people sent me a link to this, and we are going to uh, check this out and see if there's anything juicy in here. So, Guild Wars 2 Q&A, ArenaNet on Switch, two yearly expansions, Secrets of the Obscure Learnings, and 2024 updates. Following the MMORPG's 10-year anniversary celebrated last year, ArenaNet has picked up steam, partly thanks to joining Valve's namesake store, Hyok, with the ongoing development of Guild Wars 2. The Bellevue-based developer released the fourth expansion, Secrets of the Obscure, in August, and there's more coming between free content and paid expansions with the new yearly model. Look of Tech had the opportunity to access the studio's end-of-year blog post in advance, where ArenaNet confirmed that Soto, uh, I'm just going to call it Soto from now on, had been a financial success and promised that the next update, which includes new story chapters and the Temple of Phoebe Strike Challenge mode, mine new weapon, uh, sorry, nine new weapon proficiencies, the ability to unlock new legendary gear, and a Wizard's Vault reward refresh would arrive early next year. Uh, at the same time, we were able to set up a chat with game director Josh Davis to discuss the big changes to the game's development pace, their learnings from Secrets of the Obscure, and what the future looks like for Guild Wars 2. Uh, so, really quickly, just to talk about the pace thing for anyone who doesn't know what that is. So, when Guild Wars 2 uh, released Path of... Uh, sorry, Heart of Thorns, it was many years before Path of Fire. And when they, they released Path of Fire, it was like five years before they announced End of Dragons. Like, at that point, the player base was still active just because it was a great game. However, uh, they we kind of thought that there wasn't going to be any more added to the game. When they announced End of Dragons, it was like... Yo, they're still going to do more? That's great. You know, that was wonderful. And then uh, right after that, it was such a success, they announced uh, Soto. Like, the, literally the day after uh, EOD came out, they're like, we just got greenlit for another expansion. So after Soto, uh, or after, as they announced Soto, they said, no more waiting five years for new expansion. Now you'll there'll be a new expansion every year, but they'll be smaller. So it's going to be a new release cycle. So it'll be like, uh, Soto comes out, three months, update, three months, update, three months, update, three months, new expansion, repeat. Uh, so that's what they're planning on doing. So with that, uh, hold on a sec. Looking uh, looking at chat right now. Uh, learn how to read lips, noobs. Wait, what? That's how it's fuzzing. What's he saying in depth now? Oh my god. Chat, is the audio still working good? I see someone freaking out that they're... i just making sure that this is not a me problem. If, it, if just Smashy has his freaking player muted, that's a Smashy problem. Audio's fine. Okay, it's a Smashy problem. It's a great thing he can't hear what I'm saying about him right now. Moving on. So, yeah. New cadence cycle, new release cycle for Soto. Uh, by the way, there's a 75% discount code. Uh, discount available from today to January 4th on the first two expansions, Heart of Thorns, Path of Fire. Uh, bah, 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 and uh, End of Dragons is currently half off. Uh, these discounts are available on the official website in Steam. Moreover, the official website also offers the Elder Dragon Saga Collection, which is the first three expansions. It's also uh, the All the Living World stories. Uh, oh, wait, sorry, this one's at $20. Um, yeah, the, the, the full collection that has all of the Living World and all expansions is from $100 down to $50. Uh, yeah, I did a, a video on that uh, yesterday, and it has uh, the referral links and all that in there, so if you're interested in picking those up, you can use those links. But, yeah, this briefly touches on that. All right, there was a four and a half year span between Path of Fire and End of Dragons. Now, though, you've settled on a much quicker pace for the expansions. What prompted this change? Will you attempt to keep the yearly expansion model for the foreseeable future? There are two main drivers behind this change. All right, so the bold stuff is from the interviewer. The not bold text is probably from Josh. Uh, there are two main drivers behind this change. First, we want to provide a better game experience to fans by adopting a more consistent release cadence, eliminating extended content droughts, and increasing support for the core game, World v. World, Fractals, etc. Second, we want to adopt a dev cycle that would allow our team to maintain a healthy work and life balance. We're in a marathon, not a sprint. The structure of this approach allows us to take a long-term outlook toward planning, which helps with scheduling and staffing. In terms of the future, we're actively working on an expansion for 2024, Expansion 5, and planning one for 2025, Expansion 6, which is about as far into the future as we can reasonably foresee. You've said Secrets of the Obscure was financially successful for ArenaNet. Can you share a ballpark of how many developers you've got actively working on Guild Wars 2 content, rather than possibly on other projects, now? Also, how big is the Steam player base compared to those who play through the regular launcher? 
Uh, that's an interesting question because you can use um, the statistics that are publicly available on Steam in order to find how many Steam players are playing almost any given game, but it's harder to find statistics on how many people are playing Guild Wars 2 through the standalone launcher than it is the Steam launcher. Um, our current team size is uh, roughly what it was during the development of Living World Season 4 and about 15% larger than it was at the release of End of Dragons in 2022. That's a lot of words without giving a number. Thanks to the support of our fans, we've been able to grow our team in recent years, but we've been very careful not to expand too quickly or beyond our means. Maintaining stability of our employees is top priority for myself and the rest of our leadership team. Yeah, uh, so it wasn't not, it was not too long ago that, uh, was it uh, NCSoft uh, ordered ArenaNet that they had to like fire 100 people? Uh, and they, that was just like a couple years ago. They had to let a bunch of people go. They had a really rough year because of that. Um, now, financially, they're doing much better now, but they definitely don't want to uh, put themselves in a position where they have to do that again. It's worth noting that Guild Wars 2 team is fairly small compared to many of our direct competitors. In some cases, we're less than half the size of other studios. We're scrappy. This isn't new for us. Our player-friendly monetization philosophy and lack of subscription fees create some tight constraints for us to work with within that others don't necessarily have to contend with. But this is a trade-off we're happy to make. That's true. When you compare something like um, World of Warcraft, you pay for the base game. Uh, well, actually, that's changed over time. Eventually, they, I think they made the base game uh, free up to a certain point. But you pay for every expansion, and you pay like fifteen dollars a month, uh, unless you do like the coin thing. But you know that somebody had to pay fifteen dollars a month for that. Uh, and then, if you want stuff from the shop, you pay for that. This game, you know, G uh, Guild Wars Two, you pay for the game, you pay for the expansions. There's no monthly fee. And when Living World Seasons come out, or when they came out in the past, they're kind of done with that now, they were free at launch. That always blew my mind. They were free at launch, but they cost money later if you didn't get them at launch. But if you were, you know, and usually for companies, it's, it's backwards. Usually for companies, it's the other way around. Like right when something launches is when people are willing to pay full price for it, and that's when they charge for it. Uh, so they, they have been generous in the past, that stuff. But that means that... Uh, they've got to constantly push out new stuff to the gem store in the game, which is usually cosmetic stuff. Like there's uh, there's a new cape here. I think one of the hottest new items right now uh, is the plush sky scale. Um, just for sake of conversation, is th this right here? It's a different skin for your dragon mount. Just makes it look like a giant, cute stuffed animal. Stuff like that. So they release stuff like that that costs gems, and you can buy it with real money. And that's uh, purchases of expansions and purchases of stuff from the gem store is most of their in-game income right now they have been you know very cool uh, very good with that um you know the, as, as far as monetization goes i think that the way they do it is completely fair uh i kind of want to compare it to something like path of exile you know path of exile is completely free to play uh however they make a living by just selling cool looking stuff they, they've got a few quality of life things in the their gem store but it's mostly just cool looking graphics and skins and stuff like that that you can buy but you don't have to so you'll get some people that'll buy a ton of stuff and other people that buy none and it keeps the company afloat and no one really hates them for how they do that and i like that i, I very much like that as for the steam question it remains a small portion of our overall player base, but this wasn't a surprise, given that Guild Wars 2 was available for 10 years on our first-party platform before launching on Steam. Most MMO players had likely heard of our, uh, or experienced the game at some point. However, something that's been very interesting is how much of our first-party new player acquisition has improved from being on Steam. Our new player acquisition numbers are the strongest they've been since 2016 and 17. Really? that we saw more first-time players in 2023 than we did at any point during the COVID pandemic gaming boom, which was a pleasant surprise. That is wild. That's actually wild. Because, uh, okay, so the, the COVID boom is, of course, referring to uh, when everybody was locked up at home because, uh, you know, we were trying to stop spreading that around. And tons of people just pulled up the internet and started playing video games. So, uh, and they didn't have... Uh, even much better to do and almost every video game you know it feels kind of bad saying it but it is a fact like this industry got a huge surge of traffic during that because people were online playing video games um especially you know games that were free to jump into 
Guild Wars 2, the base game all the way up to max level is free. So there was a lot of people that got into it. And I, I can back that up as well. Obviously, I don't, I don't work for ArenaNet. I don't have their numbers. But I have a massive amount of guides out on the game. So I can see the traffic that those YouTube videos get. And I've got new player guides. I can see the days when those guides spike, stuff like that. So yeah, this, this is actually incredible um, that that happened. Um, you said you're now able to take a lo more long-term approach to planning, with lessons learned from Soto that will apply to Expansion 5 in very meaningful ways. Could you go into the specifics of which areas will be affected? We're learning a lot about how we develop and release content on this cadence, which absolutely has a downstream effect on the player experience. The overall shape of development being Expansions 4 and 5 are very similar. Timelines, resourcing, etc. Even if the content and the features are not. This means that we're able to focus more on refining our development processes than reinventing them. The better that we can identify production issues like undocumented dependencies, bottlenecks, resourcing issues, etc. mean that we can proactively address those issues in future dev cycles. Uh, this makes total sense. So essentially, you know, this was the first of their yearly expansions. They had to figure out, like, you know, obviously the artists make art, but, you know, who's, uh, you know, who's going to do what? What timetable will they have? How much time do they have to work on it? You know, how many zones will they be expected to spit out? How many new sets of armor will they be expected to sit out? Uh, the balancing team, how many new skills are the classes getting? How much will they be required? You know, when are they going to have meetings? Stuff like that. Um, it makes total sense that after doing it for the first yearly expansion, they'll almost have a template that they can use to speed up how it's going to happen for the follow-up yearly expansions. Um, just to take a small break from this, uh, Asmodian Leader uh, in YouTube chat says, How is Guild Wars 2 nowadays? I like PvP. It's great. Uh, it's, it's not perfect. I won't act like it is. But for me, it is the best MMO out there. The combat system is still the... Like, anytime I try to play, like, World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XIV, anything like that, I'm like, God, this combat just feels so ancient compared to Guild Wars 2. Uh, even though it's it's 10 years old, I, I, it was so far ahead of its time when it launched. Um, <laughs> obviously, as a Guild Wars 2 streamer, I'm a huge fan of it, but uh, that, that is my honest answer. Okay, so from our experience with Soto alone, we've just... Oh, we already read this paragraph. Uh, okay. Uh, in Soto... Uh, we, you have ditched the elite specializations added to each of the previous expansions in favor of new weapon proficiencies. Does that mean no more elite specs will be introduced in future Guild Wars 2 expansions? Uh, before I even read this question, I'm thinking that they're going to be done with them. Because in no other game do they have, no other like, major MMO, do they, uh, do I think they have this much of a nightmare balancing all these classes? Um, and the thing is, is like, if you play World of Warcraft, they've, uh, you know, you, if you're a Death Knight, if you're Frost, you're DPS, if you're Unholy, you're DPS, if you're Blood, you're a tank. That's it. Un unless it's changed in the last year. Uh, that's it. There's not a lot of ways to build your character wrong. There are, there's some slight, like, you know, do you want to have this cooldown or this cooldown? But there's not a lot of ways to build the character just wrong. And in Guild Wars 2, there's a lot of freedom with your build to the point that you can make some broken stuff in a good way and you can make some broken stuff in a bad way. So it's very possible for people to hit max level and still have absolutely no idea what they're doing. And because of that, uh, you know, it's, it's tricky to balance all these elite specs and then against each other because it's like, okay, you're not comparing blood DK versus defensive warrior, you're comparing blood DK who took this specialization with blood DK that took this specialization with blood DK that took these traits against the warrior that took these, you know, like every class has 50 variations of it. So there's, there's a lot to go on. And right now, you know, we've got nine classes. They've each got three elite specs. So that right there is basically 27 different classes. They play very differently to one another. It's not just like different flavors, kind of like how Frost and the Holy Death Knights were in WoW, to use that example again. You know, you the, the Soul Beast plays completely differently than Untamed. Hollowsmith plays incredibly differently than Mechanist does. Like, yeah, they're both DPS, but they're completely different. Uh, so it's, it's become very troublesome to balance. It would not surprise me if they were done with elite specs. Okay. Uh, we're not ready to shut the door on elite specs yet. It's always possible that they'll make a return in a future expansion. 
for now, we like the flexibility that focusing on weapons offers, and we've proven out that uh, we can add new layers of gameplay interaction through just the weapons themselves. We plan to focus on weapons to the next expansion, but we have a fun surprise in store to keep things fresh and exciting. Ooh, I wonder what that is. Uh, so the weapon specialization honestly had a similar effect than the elite specs. Now, with just adding a new weapon, they didn't have to make the specialization, they didn't have to come up with a unique class mechanic, they didn't have to make nine new traits for the thing. Um, also, elite specs come with a set of skills themselves. For example, Druid had this glyph, it has these Late on glyphs, dropping off the primer for the one. month. Happy holidays, Muck. Uh, so that's, you know, one heal skill, four utility skills, one elite skill that they would have to make for each elite spec. With weapons, you just have to make the weapon skills, which is more of a nightmare for something like Weaver, but for most of it, it's just, you know, five new weapon skills. Um, however, I will say the weapon master training, that did kind of uh, throw a, another wrench into the, you know, difficulty to balance the game. Because when they added weapon master training, when suddenly you had Solby sniping people with druid staves, Every single weaver was using, uh, or sorry, every single like catalyst was using weaver, sword, and uh, tempest warhorn. Like there was just so many broken combinations. Uh, dragon hunters were using, uh, or sorry, willbenders were using dragon hunter longbows, um, and there was, but so like th there was the core class plus three elite specs that all got each other's weapons. There was like eighty or ninety new combinations that weren't available before. Some of them were stupid and dumb, and others were completely busted, and they had to come in with nerf bat swinging. They were not ready for that. Uh, now, I don't know if they ever could have been ready for that, but yeah, so I mean, it's kind of the same thing as, you know, the elite spec thing, nightmare to balance idea. Uh, very interesting what the surprise in store is going to be. I'm very interested in what that's going to be. Yeah, all scourges using pistol from Harbinger. Like, Harbinger pistol is a very... You compare it to engineer pistol, it's it's insane. It's not even close. It's a it's a busted weapon. And then you put that on a class that is already for quite strong, like Scourge. Boom, 60k DPS nerfed in the next patch. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of examples like that. Um, how did you settle on these specific weapon proficiencies for each class? Also, is the Ranger ever going to get rifle and pistol? No, shut up. We don't need more. Pro okay, this person does a PVP. In PVP, projectile block is everywhere. Do not give rangers more projectile weapons. Give me like a focus or a shield or something. Do not give me more projectile weapons. Okay, there are many ways to go about designing new kits or abilities. For example, you might start by identifying interesting high-level themes and aesthetics and then building the gameplay around these concepts, such as a gunslinging necromancer. That's how many of the base professions and elite specializations came to be in Guild Wars 2. For Soto, we chose a slightly different tact focused on addressing shortcomings in each profession. We started the new weapon design process by identifying gameplay gaps in each profession's kit across PvE, PvP, and World vs. World. This included examining high-level roles such as the traditional boon support, healing and damage, and more niche considerations like non-projectile range damage options for World vs. World, due to the amount of projectile hate via reflex and blocks. Thank you. The goal in all of this is to make more professions in, uh, usable in a wider variety of contexts. There's plenty of gaps left for us to address, but we're making good progress toward the introduction of weapon mastery training, the latest weapon proficiencies, and our ongoing skills and balance work. As for the ranger getting pistol and rifle, no comment. Don't do it! You've never added focus to anybody ever. Give it to us. All right. Um, you recently conducted the weapon proficiencies beta. Community feedback seemed to range from very positive to quite negative, depending on the class and weapon addition. Can you share any tweaks that will be based, uh, that will be, any tweaks that will be based on that feedback? Okay. All right. Uh, really quick pause here. Uh, Bookworm says, I'm personally not a fan of the three-month update, three-month update system. Feels like early access content where we pay first and wait for the devs to fulfill their promises, but that's just my opinion. Um, I don't think it's the exact same as early access, but I can understand your comparison. I don't think it's unfair that you say that. Uh, hi, Star, I see you. Uh, crazy as a guard made to hear somebody praying for focus, it's not that engaging. Uh, Wimper, the, the thing is, is... The the focus might be the only weapon in the game that's never been added to a class since the launch of the game ten years ago. So it's just it's kind of like a meme for me at this point. You know, kind of like a World v World Alliances. Like World v World Alliances win when someone gets focus. You know, it's kind of like that for 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 me. Anyway, 
Also, also, my favorite legendary in the game is Binding of Vipos, and it's a focus, and only get to use it if it gets added to characters I play. So, there you go. And that, that's part of it, too. Totally admit that. All right, we're not quite ready to share any news, but we'll be back early next year with a blog post that outlines the changes we're making based on player feedback. The Wizard's Vault objectives seem a bit too skewed towards PvP. Is there any chance more PvE objectives will be added to the mix? Yes, we plan to continue refining and adding new objectives across game modes for new and existing content alike. Uh, yeah, honestly, my only complaint with the Wizard's Vault is this, this UI. Um, the, there's been many times I open this and it's just blank, and then I gotta close it and reopen it, sometimes two times to get it to actually load. And then if there's a bunch of things I'm collecting and I click multiple times too fast, I get an error message that pops up. Um, th I think this thing is like a Chromium page web browser. Uh, I, I, that's the only complaint I have about it. The Wizard's Vault is grown on me. I think, it, I think it's okay. I will say I wish it auto collected the login reward each day because I, I admit guys, I forget to click the login reward like four days out of five. Uh, I, I, I'm still trying to train myself to do that. Um, okay. In September, you essentially delayed the Alliance system in favor of going live with the long anticipated World v. World restructuring. Is there any update you can provide on alliances? Will it return at some point next year? The term world restructuring and alliances are often used by our community interchangeably, despite being very different things. World restructuring describes the new team-based world v. world matchmaking system we've been developing for the past years, while alliances are a subcomponent of that system that allows multiple small to mid-sized guilds to group together for matchmaking. As we started digging into Alliance's implementation, it became increasingly clear to us that we were on the path to building a system that would largely be duplicative of guilds and the functionality that they offer. Players can cr uh, already create Alliance-like guilds that contain up to 500 players. Now, the main downside of this pivot is that not every player has a free guild slot they're willing to use to join a new super guild. We're actively looking for solutions for this that don't require the steep development investment that Alliance's would. We would have more news to share on that front early next year. We should have more news to share on that early next year. Uh, for new players, navigating through Guild Wars 2's many currencies can be confusing. Is there any plan to consolidate some of them? Before I even read that, my first thought is they just did that with dungeons. Uh, the dungeon currency was just uh, combined into many different, like there was like eight different dungeon currencies combined into one. However, you know, this is still right here. There's still a lot of them. Um, they also combined the shards now it's, uh, I'm trying to remember. Is it, isn't it just like blue shards as old strikes, green shards as new strikes, or vice versa? I don't even recall. I, as you can tell, I haven't had to buy anything from the shard merchant in a long time. I, I just like to do strikes. Uh, considering how many I have of these, I'm guessing blue is old and green is new. So, like, that was a new thing. Then they did the thing with coins, like antique coins and unusual coins. Uh, so that was a thing. Some of the, that's these others, I would be surprised if they touched, like the courts and things like or geodes and things like that i'm not sure if they'll ever ever touch those but uh let's see what they say um yes we have a long list of core game improvements we'd like to make and this is one of many items on that list a comprehensive update to currencies is a big undertaking so we're likely to do it in smaller chunks as time allows for example we took a step towards currency unification last year with the consolidation of dungeon currencies into tales of dungeon delving yep the base game's dungeons look a bit like leftover content at this point, but they can be really cool in terms of story and atmosphere. Did you consider adding challenge modes to make them relevant once again for the end game loop? <laughs> no, this is not something we're currently considering. Uh, I will say, just off to the topic, like the way I consider balance, which not everyone will agree with me, and that's fine. Please remember, I have no power here. Um, is if you've got five man content, like in this game, there's dungeons, fractals, and dragon response missions. How much time do they take, and how much money do you get for that time? Fractals gives you the most money for the time spent. So if Fractals, I don't know, takes 15 minutes and gives you 15 gold, if a dungeon takes 30 minutes, I think it should give you about 30 gold. Those are very rough numbers. Hopefully my point has made it across to you. So one, I think dungeons should give you know, money or loot more according to amount the time you spend on them, just like fractals do. And honestly, I, I think that they need just like a bit of polish. Like some of them 
are are ancient uh, and you know could use some touch-ups. But it's like they don't need to remake new five-man content from scratch. They could just go do like you know a, a, an overhaul, like a, a, a touch-up, like a polishing some of the dungeons, and you know they could be very relevant again. But one of the things needs to be the loot, like Guild Wars Two. I just like the combat system. I'll I'll do any content in the game because the combat system is fun. It's just that if you know the Cold War Strike mission or Bone Skinner takes a fraction of the time of the tank escort, but they give the same loot, I'm gonna do the one that takes less time and get you get more money. So uh, I I would like to see them kind of polish up dungeons, uh, but we'll see. Uh, as a follow-up on the endgame topic, could you share which activities you plan to focus on for future improvements and expansions? In the first half of next year, we'll be introducing the Temple of Phoebe Strike Mission Challenge Mode and a new five-player Fractal Dungeon and Challenge Mode. Beyond that, I think fans will be pretty stoked when they hear about our plans for endgame PvE content in the next expansion. Hmm. Interesting. On the Temple of Phoebe Strike mission, what do you guys think? You know, right now it's basically the boss has six abilities and you can choose two of them to empower. You think challenge mode is going to be four of them get empowered or all six get empowered? I would be surprised if it's anything other than that. All 12, there will be six additional ones also. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. So yeah, I think fans will be pretty stoked when they hear about our plans for endgame PvE content next expansion. Hmm, something to think about. Raid Wing 8? Just more strike I mean, honestly, I, I like strike missions, so more strike missions. The way he said that makes me think that it's going to be something new. Something new and shiny. So very curious about that. 50-man raids? Going to go to Molten Core? There's a growing interest in alternate modes, like hardcore servers, classic servers, etc. in the MMO genre. Do you have any plans to offer anything like servers with more challenging PvE difficulty, for example? Hey, yo, flashback to when someone at BlizzCon asked for a, a classic server and that guy on stage was like, you think you want that, but you don't. And now classic World of Warcraft has more players than retail. It's an interesting idea, but it's not a priority for us. Trend chasing is inherently risky and could potentially alienate your existing fans if it goes poorly. From what we've observed in the industry over the past few years, it usually doesn't pan out. Uh, fair to say usually, because he didn't say always. There are times it pans out. For now, we're focusing on serving our current community and making Guild Wars 2 the best it can be. Since it sounds like the game will be supported for many years to come, are you evaluating the addition of modern, render modern rendering features such as TAA support, which could in turn open up to upscalers like NVIDIA DLSS and AMD FSR? I only know what one of those three things is. Uh, as for TAA or DLSS support, it's not a priority for us right now, but it's certainly a possibility down the road. There's plenty of lower hanging fruit that we'd like to get to first. We believe Guild Wars 2 will be around for years to come, so we've been putting an increased focus on long-term tech investments, both in terms of player-facing improvements, visual fidelity, uh, performance, or in developer-facing improvements, tools and workflow. We've completed our upgraded DX11 from DX9 earlier this year, and on top of unlocking some small performance improvements, it's also opened some interesting possibilities for our developers for upcoming content, like new shaders and lighting options. Thank you for your time. And that is the end of the article. That's pretty cool. Definitely, there was a few scraps of new information. And for anyone curious, this is uh, an older video. Uh, this is just where they you know, showcase some of the stuff from uh, the uh, Through the Veil. Uh, this is the Through the Veil teaser. So that's not something new. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, they teased a couple of small things, like there's going to be some new PvE endgame stuff next year. We hope you guys like it. You know, things like that. Um, you know, we're going to continue pushing out like new weapons. Now, an interesting thing on that topic is uh, Warrior is the class closest to having every weapon in the game. Because at launch, Warrior had more weapon options than many classes. I think Engineer had the least. Because Engineer, I think, just had Pistol, Pistol, Pistol Shield, and Rifle. That's it. That's all they had at launch. Because they had kits. Uh, so they could keep adding a new weapon each year for to Engineer for like a decade. Warrior in just a few years is going to have every weapon ca you know, done unless they come up with something new or they're like, Warriors, we heard you wanted uh, tridents underwater. Ah, yeah, you're excited. 
<laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, every weapon except focus. Uh, they don't have scepter either. Off the top of my head, there's another one. Um, but yeah, there's uh. <laughs> Now the question is, will they turn Scepter into a greatsword also? Just allow them to use underwater weapons out of uh, water. They won't get focus. No one gets focus. Yeah. Uh, Warrior doesn't have shortbow, I don't think. Hmm. No, they just have the the, the one that does the fire bow. Uh, they can let Warrior wield offhand weapons and mainhand. Uh, my point is, they would have to change the rules. Never since the launch of the game have they added a new weapon type. And never have they been like, oh, you can now use Torch in main hand. Uh, yeah, they, they've, never, they've never done that. So that would require them to uh, change the rules in some way. If they continue doing the yearly thing and they continue adding a new weapon to all classes each year, in just a couple of years, Warrior is going to be full up. And they're going uh, unless to... They, unless they mark it like an overhaul. Like, uh, what? okay, what's the least used Warrior weapon? Torch? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think, what is the least used warrior weapon? Maybe if they marketed it like, okay, everyone's getting a new weapon except warrior, but because warrior's got everything, and they're like, for warrior, we're taking their least used weapon, and we're giving it a complete overhaul, and it's going to have a much more attractive kit. That could be another way they could do it. Offhand mace. Uh, offhand mace, offhand sword mace. Uh, mace was mo mace was mostly just used for break bars, right? Uh, give warriors uh, warrior dual frying pan. That makes me think of um, dead cells, the pan chaku. Main hand pistol, short bow focus scepter. Uh, well, pistol the main hand pistol is not that old because that just got oh wait no off hand pistol. I'm sorry, got added with blade sworn. I was thinking of the wrong thing. Um, give warriors uh, dual focus and the skills be unarmed com combat. Yeah, but then it would be funny. Okay, give warriors dual focus and have the skills be unarmed combat would be funny because then they could use this, the skins for existing focuses in the game and it would just be like a warrior beating you to death with like a voodoo doll and a book. Warrior can now use Gorik as a weapon. Jesus. Our training guild was to find guardian staff mostly change. I need my reaper to dual wield a sword so you think it'll take all death. Okay, well, yeah, uh, that is the end of this article. Uh, I, as always, I will link that down below for anyone who wants to see it, and it is linked into the chats as well if anyone uh, watching this live wants to see it. But yeah, there was a there was a few new uh, little little breadcrumbs, little tidbits in there, and uh, it was really cool for Josh to do this. So you know, shout out to them uh, for getting this done, and thank you to the community uh, who sent me this link because I was not familiar with this website. I did not know that they did this. And, uh, yeah, any additional comments on this? Any little tidbits you think I missed? Put it down below. Tell me how I'm wrong.